So uh, welcome all of you for uh, the first chapter on mechanics of sheet metal forming course that is uh, um, introduction to sheet forming process. So in today's class uh, we are going to see uh, the first chapter okay, and it will continue for the next class also. Okay. So uh, now this first chapter is divided into actually two parts. One is uh, uh, basically introduction to uh, uh, the, the sheet forming process and then uh, uh, we will see an important uh, uh, aspect of uh, material testing that is a uh, tension test. Okay. So, uh, let us go to the introduction of sheet metal forming process. As you all are uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, metal forming operations can be divided into two categories mainly. Uh, one is a bulk forming process, the other one is a sheet forming process and this course is predominantly on sheet metal forming process mainly the, uh, the mechanics part. Okay. So, when it comes to introduction Okay, so uh, I have given uh, three important points in the, the slide. Okay, so we are all aware of the fact that uh, we have uh, hot roll strip and cold roll strip sheets. Okay, in the form of sheets. Okay, so they are basically uh, you know uh, deformed, plastically deformed, and uh, uh, certain shapes are made. Okay, to make uh, useful components in uh, you know you can see automotive industries, uh, household appliances, building items. Uh, you know um, the aerospace structures and uh, commonly used uh, food and uh, you know drink cans and variety of other known products. Okay. So, the sheets are actually uh, uh, deformed uh, using several uh, sheet forming process to make a particular shape, permanent shape changes allowed in that. Okay. Generally, we want these days a strong uh, strength to weight ratio. So, all parts are manufactured, material selection and the process optimization everything is done. Uh, keeping in mind that strength to weight ratio is uh, going to be important. Okay. So, what are the uh, common uh, sheet forming process? Uh, of course, uh, you, you all know that uh, bulk forming process are of different types. Say for example, forging, uh, extrusion, rolling, okay. so wire drawing that we generally study in uh, manufacturing technology courses. Similarly, uh, sheet forming process also can be divided into uh, you know several types and it also depends on what type of components you are going to make. For example, blanking and piercing, okay, bending, deep drawing okay. and uh, there are uh, other uh, sheet forming process uh, okay, like roll forming. Okay. So, we are speaking about sheet, it could be uh, tubes also, tube forming is also possible to make certain components. Okay. So, uh, to start with we are going to briefly see some uh, typical examples of that. Say for a first instance, you can uh, take blanking and piercing. Okay, a schematic is uh, given here in this diagram. You can see. Okay, so you have a sheet here. Okay, and uh, the sheet is actually uh, clamped using a uh, blank holder. Okay, so the clamp. It's called the clamp. Okay, so the sheet is held on one side, and the other side is uh, uh, free to uh, you know deform. Okay, so and you have a uh, punch or you call it as a die that is called cutting die. The cutting die is uh, slightly different from other dies uh, which we use in other sheet forming process. Here the main purpose of die is actually to cut the sheet. Okay. As you see in this diagram, uh, so the uh, sheet is undergoing severe plastic deformation in this region and uh, you will see that uh, at one particular stage uh, fracture is going to get developed and these two regions will get uh, separated. Okay. And uh, this part will actually uh, come down okay, and it will be separated from this part of the sheet. Okay. So, generally this operation is done in process okay, and additional blanking may be required later to remove extra material and punch holes. Okay, that is a, a, the entire process and uh, if you closely look at this, it is actually a complex process of plastic shearing and fracture. Okay. So, you need to have a plastic deformation in this uh, clearance region, this clearance is also very important in this case and this particular parameter uh, clearance is uh, going to be generally uh, you know designed in such a way that appropriate cutting is actually done. Okay. And uh, you will see that this edge region, this edge region that means this region which is undergoing deformation okay, will undergo uh, localized hardening. Okay. So, that is very important and uh, this uh, shearing as such is not going to make a, a shape, uh, you know shaped component rather it is going to be helpful for sizing. Okay. So, uh, next important one is called as uh, bending. So, this bending is a very common process used to for making uh, uh, several sheet components. Okay. For example, uh, you can have uh, household utensils, uh, washing machine parts like that. The components are actually bent at certain locations and other than that several other forming process are also available to make that component. Okay. So, this uh, schematic is actually uh, straight uh, 
uh, line bent. Okay. So, that means uh, this uh, portion was initially you know you can see horizontal in nature and uh, uh, we will see in the next slide okay there are uh, uh, you know uh, presses which is used to bend it to about 90 degree you can imagine okay so the angle is about a 90 degree here okay so and the bending is done in one line okay so that's why it's called straight line bend okay it's a basic uh, plastic deformation process so and the plastic deformation happens here only in this uh, bend zone you can imagine okay this portion and this portion uh, are not going to have uh, uh, any plastic deformation okay it's unaffected region okay but uh, this type of bending process will also have some problems for instance uh, they will have uh, elastic uh, spring back which we are going to discuss uh, elaborately uh, you know little later part of this course uh, but uh, the brief idea here is suppose this angle is 90 degree so uh, you know you, you can imagine that after you, you, we think that bending is over then we remove load so this will not be 90 degree this will be a rather a different angle okay so that uh, change in dimension is because of uh, we can say it as elastic uh, spring back okay so this spring back has to be minimized there are several methods that people follow in the subject uh, okay we will see how to model this elastic spring back in a very uh, you know simplest fashion and uh, the main problem is if you allow spring back then uh, assembly of these parts with respect to other parts will be a difficult uh, task so what are the different uh, bending methods these are some schematic i have given here a b c d Okay, so uh, you can imagine that uh, bending is done using four different processes. Okay, uh, the A part is uh, is going to be little folding type of thing. Okay, you can hold the sheet in this particular region, and uh, okay, the sheet is actually clamped here, and it is uh, uh, rotated in this direction, or of course you can rotate it in the opposite direction also, and uh, you can make a sheet of like this. Sheet will be bent like this. Okay, so uh, to get a previous uh, one, this type of L-shaped bending is possible. Okay. So, there are other ways of bending, uh, this is another example the B part is called V die bending okay, where uh, you have a die and uh, there is a groove, okay, V groove okay, on which uh, you have a sheet and the punches are of the same size of the uh, you know, V die okay, and uh, you can see that uh, the punch is going to move down and it is going to touch the flat sheet and the further you move down it will be bent like this. Okay. So, once you remove the punch okay, it has to have that particular shape. Okay, uh, what do you need of a desired uh, dimension? For example, uh, fully bent sheet should have this type of uh, bent section, isn't it? So uh, that is the uh, another bending process. Okay, so roll forming, as I was telling you, so roll forming is another method where you can see that uh, rolls are used. These are all actually rolls, and a sheet is kept in between, and uh, the roll is actually going to roll, and then it's going to create this type of uh, bending. Okay. So, you can have uh, channel suctions, okay. uh, you know like for example, uh, uh, wide panels like roofing sheet uh, or intricate channel suctions can be produced using roll forming uh, you know, machines and you can have uh, numerous sets of rolls uh, successfully uh, bend the sheet. Okay. It is just not in one section, you can have uh, different uh, you know, uh, sets of rolls and it is getting continuously uh, bent okay, to make any channel section. This D type is uh, called the flanging and it is a relatively well known uh, uh, you know method okay you know like uh, in piercing you have a uh, cutting die right instead of that you have a just a uh, flanging tool and it is not going to cut the portion with the bend region it is just going to bend it okay. So, it is not going to really shear uh, cut the uh, sheet rather it is going just going to bend it and you will see that finally you are going to make a L shaped component like this okay. So, basically the flanging tool flange tool is going to move down in this way and is going to push the sheet towards the uh, die which is kept stationary here okay. and once you release the flanging tool we want this 90 degree shape but then there will be some slight change in the angle which is what I was referring to as a uh, sheet spring back which we will discuss uh, elaborately later on. Section bending, section bending is little uh, complex in nature when compared to other uh, simple process we discussed before okay and uh, here uh, uh, as given in the schematic you can see it is basically like a channel okay starting from here uh, to here and uh, the channel is also of a complex shape that uh, uh, you know like uh, you can see that there is a, a significant height of deformation uh, given here and there are a lot of uh, problems here because you will see that there is a bending here and there is bending here okay and uh, the edge region is going to undergo deformation okay and uh, you can also see that uh, as referred uh, uh, to the schematic there is 
a small fracture here and there is a lot of wrinkles here okay and because of that you will see that this height is going to be lesser than this particular height okay so the sheet is curved into a more intricate shape okay it shows the schematic of the process the flange of the channel is strained and many split at the left end of the portion and leg height h will drop that's what i was telling you okay so you are going to be a little bit careful in this type of defects okay wrinkling and an increase in flange height okay are possible on the right hand side okay so here fracture is possible here wrinkling is possible because of that uh, your uh, you know your height of deformation here and here are going to be uh, slightly different so one has to be careful okay when you deform this kind of uh, intricate shapes uh, using bending so there are other uh, sheet forming uh, you know operations like uh, fms1 is uh, stretching okay as the name says so uh, the schematic also uh, shows that as an example you can see this is the actual sheet the upper part okay and you can see the setup here in b part okay where the same sheet is actually clamped between the die and the blank holder i hope you all are aware of the fact that in sheet forming you need uh, tools for example die and blank holder and punch to uh, deform the sheet plastic okay so die is kept on top and blank holder is going to clamp the uh, sheet uh, onto the die and you have friction between at the interfaces here on both the sides okay and uh, you can imagine that in the top view it's going to be of this particular type of deformation so punch is going to touch the sheet first and further displacement in the punch will deform the sheet in this fashion and you can see a part is nicely going to give a section view of how the deformation is going to be okay the punch is pushed into the sheet okay now one important point here is uh, the sheet uh, most often it is not going to be drawn in this movement is generally restricted here because of the clamping force and your friction interface friction so what happens is there is going to be significant tensile forces that are generated at the at the center forces at, at, the, at the center region okay these are the forces that cause deformation and contact is between the punch and the sheet is very much lower than that of generally yield strength of the sheet that's what generally people say so uh, uh, this uh, stretching okay uh, we are going to discuss elaborately uh, in uh, further chapters uh, can also be uh, used as a material testing method okay so you can use this as a uh, formability uh, test okay so to see uh, you know uh, you know what is uh, this this particular let us say what is the height of deformation okay let us say this is height okay so let us say this is your for example it is your height is for example so what is the height of deformation you can have at which uh, you have a fracture in this location okay that can be used as a measure for uh, sheet formability okay so that can be uh, well discussed with respect to this figure as uh, h let us say this height of forming okay so more complex uh, details going to come in future but i'm just giving you an idea here and then hole extrusion is another uh, you know uh, sheet forming process it is also called as a hole stretching so uh, the same stretching operation you can imagine that uh, a sheet has got a hole at the center okay there is a hole at the center and there is a punch okay there are standard methods for that we are not going to discuss about that but okay the punch is going to deform the uh, sheet but where hole is uh, located okay so then you will have this kind of uh, you know deformation okay this is uh, the height at which uh, to which the hole is deformed okay so a small uh, hole is made okay a small hole means a hole should be uh, diameter should be lesser than that of the punch diameter is initially bored into the sheet the punch can then be forced into the sheet to raise the lip lip means this particular region okay lip so now what will happen this whole edge will undergo a typical deformation process and the material should not fail before it reaches one particular height and especially failure will happen mainly in the edges so you have to be a little bit careful in that so your hole stretching okay or extrusion of punched hole is very important to understand how hole is going to deform when you go for actual sheet forming process okay depending on this one can select the uh, you know the material Uh, responsible for making a uh, good material which is be useful for making uh, that kind of uh, components uh, so i have just written here that the splitting will limit the height of extrusion will be appreciated okay so the larger the height it would be better but at the same time you should be able to uh, make the you know the hole stretching operation okay without any uh, problem okay that means a fracture should not happen at the edge region so this stamping 
or uh, draw die forming is uh, another method like uh, deep drawing which you are going to see in the next slide. So, here uh, you will see that uh, stamping is generally uh, a shallow deformation process. It is also called as draw drying form. Okay. So, draw dry forming. So, I have given you some schematic here you can see that uh, it is a shallow drawn part okay. not like your uh, uh, deep drawn cup. It is a shallow drawn cup okay. or a pan something like that you can imagine. So, the sheet is kept on the you know above the die you can see that here it is a die and there is a punch that is a punch is shown here in the B part and it is going to deform the sheet and the sheet is a clamped actually between the blank holder and the diary. So, the idea is same as punch stretching previously stated except material for a component is supplied by allowing the outer edge of flange to draw inwards while being restrained. So, that is the main difference here that is why I told you in the, in the previous slide that you will see that this movement of sheet in the, okay, in the radial direction is not allowed here. Okay. But on the other hand, you will see that here it is actually allowed. The material can move in this direction, but of course, with some restriction. Okay. The restriction is mainly because of holding as well as because of friction. Okay. So, it moves inwards and then you make a component of this particular shape. So, what are the applications? A lot of applications you can see. One is automotive body panels okay, are created and there are several you know stainless steel simple pans are used for many you know applications. So, they are all made by this type of process. Okay. So, the, the tools are same. Okay. You have punch, you have a die ring uh, or a, you know you can also call it as a draw ring and then a blank holder which is used to make this particular component. So, deep drawing, deep drawing is similar to this particular process only thing is here the drawing is actually a little deeper. Okay. So, you make a larger cups okay. like for example, you have this you know soft drinks can those things are made by components are made by a deep drawing process. Of course, there are several stages in that predominantly it is a deep drawing process and uh, the tools are going to remain same. So, you have punch, you have die, you have blank holder. So, purpose of blank holder is going to is nothing but holding the sheet and that is going to lie above the die and uh, you have a punch which is going to touch the initial sheet which is kept like this and then uh, the punch is going to move down and the sheet is going to get deformed in this way and this movement radial movement Okay, inward radial movement of sheet is actually permitted. Okay, and uh, you will see this particular example is for partially drawn sheet. That is why you have a, a cup bottom, a cup wall, and a flange region. Okay, so this portion is called flange region of the sheet, and this is cup wall of the sheet, and this is your cup bottom of the sheet. Okay, so uh, here uh, of course when you speak about uh, deep drawing okay so the ideal uh, you know actual aim is basically to make a full cup like this okay there is no flange region here so you have to make a full cup in this so that means uh, the whole flange region should be converted into a cup wall uh, whole flange region should be converted into a cup wall that is the meaning here okay so here there are uh, two or uh, three important uh, parameters other than uh, the sheet material properties itself uh, one is this clearance like uh, let us call this as c the c has to be very important okay if uh, c is less then something is going to happen that you will see in next slide if c is a large then then also it will lead to some other uh, problems defects during deep drawing so this uh, clearance should be appropriate that actually depends on the sheet thickness let us say thickness is t naught initial thickness is t naught okay and uh, instantaneous thickness is let us say t okay so this clearance should actually take care of this particular thickness let us say for example you have 2 mm thick sheet means the clearance should be slightly larger than this 2 mm thick sheet that's the way you have to give clearance there are formula available for that so one can look into it so now other than that lubrication is important so you have a friction between the punch and the sheet okay uh, then uh, you have a blank holder and the uh, sheet okay and die and the sheet okay so interface friction is going to be important and that is why we are using lubricants in the deep drawing chapter later on we are going to study very briefly about redrawing of sheets redrawing means uh, so this deep drawing is done in several stages Okay, there are two varieties in that that we will see later on, but redrawing is also possible. Redrawing means uh, instead of one stage, you make the component in let us say eight different stages. Again and again and again, the material is actually uh, redrawn to make uh, any component. But the, the principle the process is going to remain same. So, tube drawing is also possible. Like I gave an example before that um, the sheets are raw materials here, but other than that, you can also have tube as a raw material and uh, you can see that. Uh, this tube okay tube means metallic tube okay made of 
aluminum alloy or stainless steel let us like that okay and uh, uh, so those tubes can be uh, deformed on its edges or somewhere in the middle to make uh, uh, certain uh, components or shapes for example flaring flaring is uh, one way of making some shape change to the material okay tube sinking is possible tube reduction is possible like what we have in water cans no at one end uh, the diameter is actually reducing right so that is that can be made by your uh, tube reduction okay so diameter is actually going to reduce and uh, that can be made using this type of arrangement like you have a die and you can see that this diameter is larger when compared to this diameter okay and you will get a nice shape change given to this tube like this okay so uh, this is also possible in tube drawing there are several components one can make with this uh, tube drawing operations then comes a totally a new uh, type of uh, sheet forming process called as uh, fluid forming or it is famously called as a uh, hydroforming so until now whatever uh, the sheet forming process we have discussed are uh, predominantly uh, done by uh, uh, you have a punch you have a die blank holder okay and uh, mostly uh, it is done through these three important tools okay but um, instead of rigid tools rigid, rigid tools means uh, the sheet is actually deforming all other tools okay like punch die and blank holder are actually rigid okay they are not going to be deforming at all okay instead of using rigid tools what people do is they use a fluid pressure okay as a deformation medium an example is given here okay so you want to make a, a sheet part like this this is your sheet the bottom part is actually sheet or part or component you can say okay and there is a die here okay this is your die as written here and uh, you can see that uh, there is a pressure container it is written as pressure container which contains a fluid okay and uh, you are going to pressurize the fluid in the way it is given okay and uh, the fluid pressure is going to deform the uh, sheet okay to make this particular shape okay so between the uh, fluid and uh, your sheet you can have a diaphragm diaphragm is uh, given here this this particular part is actually diaphragm which is given here okay so the diaphragm is typically put over the sheet of material and pressurized in a container to make a flat pieces okay so the diaphragm is actually going to uh, it will not allow physical contact between your fluid and the sheet okay it's going to prevent uh, the contact between fluid and the sheet okay so mainly uh, to take care of uh, you know the the other uh, negative effects of uh, you know fluid onto the sheet okay just to avoid that okay you have uh, Uh, this diaphragm at the same time the diaphragm should not disturb the plastic deformation of the sheet okay special presses are needed here that is the main thing so you cannot use a conventional presses used to for your uh, sheet forming process uh, you know so you need a separate uh, press for this uh, which can take care of uh, pressurizing the fluid uh, controlling it measuring it all those things are required here uh, the the pressures needed to keep the container closed substantially stronger than those acting on the punch in a draw die because the pressure to form a sheet in sharp corners can be very high you will also see that uh, uh, in the initial part of the deformation okay you will have uh, uh, deformation other than the corner region uh, the, this die corner region and later on you will see that uh, the pressure is required to push the sheet to take this shape so this corner filling is going to be very very important so in that case uh, you need to have a uh, uh, significant pressure acting on it so uh, here this example is mainly for sheets right similarly tube hydroforming is also possible okay tube hydroforming is also possible so we will see uh, uh, one chapter at the end of the course uh, predominantly on uh, tube hydroforming and why it is important for us okay so complicated tubular parts for plumb fittings and bicycle frame brackets are heavily depend on uh, fluid forming okay so you can make uh, this kind of plumbing fittings okay and bicycle frames okay so they are made by this kind of a uh, tube hydroforming process which is generally made by uh, you know like two different process say for example you make one tube you make another tube and then you go for welding at the uh, wherever you want to assemble okay so the main advantage here is you avoid post forming process uh, uh, like uh, welding okay so that is one important advantage of uh, uh, fluid forming or hydroforming it could be sheet hydroforming or tube hydroforming okay so just to uh, complete uh, this particular uh, small chapter coining and ironing uh, coining and ironing okay so of course a uh, coining as you see in the schematic uh, okay there is a sheet 
and there is a coining tool which has got a slight impression over here and that impression will be uh, put onto the sheet in this region. Okay. So, it is basically like uh, some sort of shallow plastic deformation that can happen, but uh, that is going to be very, very intricate okay, because the sheet as we speak, what we speak is of the order of let us say 1 to 2 mm okay, or maybe 2.5 mm and you have to give some shape on the uh, in the thickness direction. So, you have to be uh, you know that, that shape is going to be a little intricate and uh, uh, you know finer dimensions have to be captured. Okay. So, that is one important thing when you speak about coining. So, during coining I will come to ironing after this. Okay. So, during coining the sheet material is heavily compressed in the through thickness direction to get the desired shape. The through thickness direction means let us say this is your T thickness. So, in this direction you are actually uh, deformation is given, but within the sheet thickness. That is why you know the intricate shapes are made uh, using this kind of coining. So, now ironing is also uh, another important one process uh, in which through thickness compression is actually going to happen like this. And this is what I was telling you uh, before in deep drawing that suppose uh, you keep a clearance okay, this clearance let us say uh, you can see this clearance in deep drawing this clearance we were speaking about right this clearance let us say is uh, smaller than the sheet thickness just for example I am saying sheet thickness is let us say 2 mm T naught, T naught is let us say 2 mm and the clearance is let us say just 1.9 1.8 mm. So, what will happen is ironing will happen okay? ironing will happen you can see that uh, actually this is your sheet and this is the cup that is formed okay, with the same punch and you have ironing die and you will see that uh, here uh, the sheet uh, the cup is going to take uh, this clearance okay, this clearance this particular clearance a dimension it is going to pick up. Okay. So, you will see that the thickness is actually getting reduced while a cup comes out. So, it is just not making of cup with a particular thickness rather it is going to be a specifically designed tool such that you want a particular thickness in the cup wall. Okay. So, you want particular thickness in the cup wall then you, you should go for ironing operation and you should also note that uh, the thickness here okay, and thickness here and the thickness here. Okay, they are not one and the same. Okay. So, I will say that an ironing die that is pushed through a cylindrical cup is slightly smaller than the punch plus the thickness of the metal. This is what I was telling you. Okay, the wall thickness can be decreased by more than half in one pass when numerous dies are used. Okay. So, the wall thickness, the cup wall thickness have to be want specific cup wall thickness then one can go for ironing operation okay. and that can be done mainly by controlling the clearance controlling the clearance between the clearance which is nothing but the gap between your uh, die inner and the punch outer. Okay. So, we will uh, briefly see uh, some uh, details about ironing later in the deep drawing chapter. Okay. So, with this uh, I am uh, I will stop uh, my uh, first introduction to uh, sheet forming operations okay, uh, which is nothing but a chapter 1 you can say okay. and uh, we will uh, immediately move on to chapter 2. So, in chapter 1 just to uh, summarize what did we see is basically some basic uh, sheet forming operations uh, you know uh, right from let us say uh, you are uh, stretching, deep drawing, then you have uh, stamping, okay, then you have simple bending okay, and different bending operations available okay, and shearing or blanking where you want to cut the sheet and then uh, finally, we have seen some uh, specialized process like tube drawing, hydro forming okay ironing operations uh, like that so uh, i think we appreciate the fact that all this uh, forming process involve uh, plastic uh, deformation okay permanent shape change is given to this uh, raw materials which are in the form of uh, sheets okay so now let us go to the second chapter uh, that is nothing but uh, material properties specifically we are going to discuss about a tension test here okay and uh, when we speak about a tension test uh, i hope all of uh, we are all aware of the fact that there are other material testing methods also. Okay. Say for example, uh, you have a compression test, they are meant for different uh, situations. Okay. Of course, you have tension test, we have studied this in you know material science uh, you know book or maybe material manufacturing technology. Okay. Then you have hardness, mm. then uh, you have uh, fatigue testing, okay. then you have uh, creep. Okay. So, there are several you know other testing methods available, okay. but uh, with respect to sheets if you see if you want to model sheet forming uh, processes okay, then you need to know how to 
calculate basic mechanical properties uh, which are generally done by tension test. And uh, this uh, tension test just to give you a very brief significance, this tension tests are uh, uh, not only used to evaluate the basic mechanical properties of sheets, it also used to select which sheet material is suitable for what type of applications. Okay, say for example, in houses we have stainless steel wash basins. Okay, so stainless steel, you know, like why we one need to choose stainless steel for that application is a question. Okay, then it basically connects us to several important uh, requirements. One of that is uh, properties. Okay, so it's a significantly drawn pan, isn't it? So uh, the the height of drawing is significant, right? So you need such type of material. So how do you calculate? How do you evaluate? How do you measure that? Is by doing tensile test and get its properties. So, the properties have to cross certain requirements to make that particular component. Okay? So, tension test used for that purpose. Okay? So, selection of uh, material for one particular application is uh, very, very important for us. So, when we speak about uh, sheet metal forming and tension test, first of all, we need to define uh, there is something called as uh, formability. Okay? This uh, formability uh, is a term uh, which is uh, defined uh, you know along with ductility. So, if we know ductility, what is ductility, then we can define formability also. So, before deforming the workpiece to a certain desired uh, shape, choosing workpiece material is very critical. This is what I was telling you, which is the first point. Strength, density, stiffness, corrosion resistance are some of the attributes that are most crucial when choosing a sheet material for a workpiece. Correct. So, what is the strength? How strong it is? Okay. So, what type of density you have, what density you have, how stiff is the material, whether corrosion resistance is significant or not, that depends on the application it is going to have okay, or some of the attributes or quality that we look into it. Okay. So, now in this uh, context, if you want to define formability, we define it like this. A typical definition of formability is this. The ability of a sheet metal workpiece to withstand plastic deformation without being damaged is referred to as formability. Okay. So, ability of sheet material to withstand plastic deformation that we already know because we want to give permanent shape change. So, naturally plastic deformation is mandatory without being damaged. Without being damaged means it should not have any uh, instability that is getting developed uh, during the course of deformation. So, what is instability? We will see it in a separate chapter, but otherwise you can take it as here as damaged means let us say fracture. Okay. The material should not fracture at all. Okay, that is the main requirement here we have. Okay. So, wherever you know the material fractures, then we say that its useful formability is over and any shape change that is given to the material uh, you know uh, before that is going to be helpful for us. Uh, beyond that, you cannot give uh, useful shape change to the material. That is the meaning. Okay. So, that is why you know I was telling you in deep drawing that uh, the height of cup that is formed is going to be very, very important. Okay. And uh, until uh, you make that component, uh, it should not fail anywhere in that cup. Okay. So, formability, this ductility also means in a way, uh, in a way it has got the same meaning. Okay. It is ability of a, a sheet metal to undergo useful plastic deformation okay, without being damaged or without being fractured. That is referred to as a formability. Okay. And uh, in this uh, context, you know the you know, meaning of elastic and plastic deformation. So, we will not discuss much on elastic deformation. I think you might have studied this in solid mechanics. Elastic deformation is generally small. Okay. So, whenever you do you know a tension test, first of all it has to cross elastic deformation, then you enter into the plasticity part. Okay. Uh, this elastic deformation is generally small and sometimes can be neglected. Okay. But at some certain situations like spring back, which we will see here, which is nothing but uh, uh, something called as elastic recovery, okay, okay, wherever spring back occurs, the elastic shape changes the final component shape and it is compatible with other incompatible with other mating parts. Okay. So, uh, it is going to disturb two things, one shape change and it is also going to disturb its compatibility with uh, the other mating parts. At that type of situations, uh, uh, the elastic deformation should not be neglected. Otherwise, whenever you go for large plastic deformation, elastic deformation is generally, uh, you know, uh, it can be neglected if it does not have any other problem like this when you go for modeling. So, now shape change in sheets, permanent shape change in sheets uh, is accompanied by plastic deformation. Okay, that is, uh, you are going to give permanent shape change to the material. Okay. We have already seen some examples. Okay, a cup formed or a shallow drawn cup that is formed by stamping or a simple bending. Okay, all involve permanent shape change. 
So now when it comes to tension test, okay, which is what the main uh, aim in this uh, particular chapter, okay, how is it generally done? Okay, so when we speak about the tension test here, okay, or tensile test, we are speaking in terms of sheet, in terms of sheet. Okay, so uh, of course the concepts are same for rods also, but sheet is a raw material here, so we are looking for sheet here. So how does the sample look like? It is like this. Uh, so I've given you a schematic here. So you can see that uh, the sample has got uh, two important regions. Uh, one is a shoulder region, other one is uh, the deforming region here. Okay, the shoulder region actually goes into the clamp. So this part actually goes into the clamp and this part also goes into the uh, UTM, clamp of the UTM. Okay, and then it is actually held rigidly such that there is no slipping between the, uh, the clamp and the, the surfaces. Okay, so generally what you do is uh, you hold it on one side and uh, you give displacement on the other side. Okay, so displacement will come in the x-axis. Okay, and depending on the material, uh, it will take a particular road to reach that particular displacement or deformation that is actually called as P. Okay. So this sample has got uh, other important features. So one after another I have written it here, but uh, this tension test is one of the most common and simple mechanical test to understand the deformation behavior of sheet material. This I already introduced to you and this figure is a tensile test piece and uh, when we speak about uh, this kind of uh, dimensions, uh, one has to refer some standards. Okay, for example, ASTM standards E8 M22 could be one reference. There are other references also, standard references you can follow. Okay, that means what? That means uh, this shouldered, you know, uh, you know, length and uh, this radius and uh, this distance and uh, this L0, okay, all are fixed. Okay, it is established over several years and one has to follow that. And thickness will change depending on what material you want to test. Let us keep it as a T0. Okay. And uh, you will see that uh, the initial width of the deforming region is let us say W0. Okay. This L0 is a reference length that we are picking up. It is generally called as a gauge length. Okay. It is called as gauge length and uh, another dimension you have that is a T0 here. That is the initial thickness. Okay. So, uh, this is a characteristic of a variety of standard test pieces that have parallel reduced dissection for at least four times that of width W0, that there are standards meant for that. Okay. Uh, so, now what do you do? So, your W0 is known to you because you are going to cut this. So, L0 is known to you, you are going to take this reference and T0 depends on the material thickness and you hold it on one side and pull it on the other side and you calculate load and that is given by the machine itself. Okay. And the load on the specimen at any instant, that is P is measured by load cell in the testing machine. So, UTM has got load cell that is going to give you load at each and every displacement. Okay. And uh, the displacement is generally referred with respect to L0 which is nothing but uh, gauge length. Okay. The gauge length is like for example 50 mm for you take it. So, 50 mm will become let us say 51, 52. Okay. It will reach up to let us say 60, 70 or 80 depending on what material you are going to deform. Okay. Large the material is good from ductility point of view means you can extend it to a larger uh, dimensions, larger lengths and that change in length is generally monitored by extensometer uh, which is a separate uh, device which is used to clamp it at the, the gauge region. Okay. You have to clamp it okay, and you have to measure the displacement. Okay. So, uh, the extensometer monitors the gauge length L0 in the middle of the specimen and at any instant the gauge length L and the extension is given by delta L is equal to L minus L0. So, uh, this delta L is called as the extension. Okay. Delta L is given by L minus L0. L is a new dimension and L0 is the initial gauge length, let us say 50. So, 51 minus 50, 52 minus 50, 53 minus 50 will give you delta L. So, this P and delta L, okay, these two are very important uh, fellows to calculate a load displacement graph which is the, uh, the raw data that the machine can give. Okay. So, then my next slide will show you you know the uh, details about load extension diagram which I have given it here. Okay. So, you uh, whenever you do tensile test of a typical metallic material, okay, uh, then you will get a, a load and extension like this. Okay. So, load in y axis generally uh, you can imagine that unit is in kilo Newton and extension is in that is delta L which is in M. Extension is in M. The load is in kilo Newton you can imagine. Okay. And uh, you all know that uh, 
the load generally uh, increases okay and it crosses uh, let us say yield strength okay that we will discuss now so let us say now it is py py is a yield load okay so and after that uh, you are going to enter into plastic deformation this region you can call it as plastically deforming region or plasticity region and it reaches uh, p max that is maximum load and uh, you will see that after p max uh, uh, the material is going to uh, deform with reduction in load and it is going to come here this way and you will have a fracture here. Okay, it is fully fractured. The sample will become two different uh, you know regions like that. Okay. So, you will see that the generally fracture generally fracture happens uh, somewhere in the middle. It is expected that fracture happens in the gauge region. Okay. So, now this particular figure I have already introduced which is load versus extension diagram and uh, here there are some important points as I told you PY is called the initial yielding load at which tensile strip starts to plastically deform. Okay. PY is actually a transit region you can imagine. Okay. So, PY is a transit region after that it is expected to deform uh, in a plastic manner. Okay. That means a permanent shape change. Okay. So, just after the yield starts. Okay. Just after the yield starts, the material undergo strain hardening. That means, when you cross PY, okay, when you cross PY, you will see that the material undergoes strain hardening in this region. Okay. Strain hardening. Okay. Uh, the consequence of strain hardening is nothing but load will keep on increasing with extension. The material becomes harder and harder when you extend, when you deform the material, right, because of strain hardening. Okay. And you will see that uh, the strain hardening occurs when tensile try to resist the deformation under loading condition. Okay. Due to strain hardening, a phenomenon that most metals alloy display, the strength or hardness of the material increases with plastic deformation. So, why strength increases during uh, plastic deformation is the mainly because of uh, strain hardening. Of course, there is one can understand the mechanism more from material science point of view, but for this particular course, uh, this, this would be more than sufficient. Okay. So, uh, the strength inc load increases with uh, displacement in the plastically deforming region is mainly because of uh, strain hardening. So, once you cross uh, the strain hardening portion, you will reach uh, a maximum load called P max. Okay. Uh, P max is the maximum load and after that something is going to happen or uh, once P max is reached, something is going to happen. Okay. So, um, what is that? During strain hardening, the load increases to P max, which is a maximum load attained during the tensile test. Fine. So, beyond this point, strip deformation stops being uniform. So, P max is a reference for uniform deformation. P max is a uh, you know reference for uniform deformation. So, uh, any shape change that you are going to give, you should be able to give when it before it reaches that particular point. Okay. And uh, whenever P max is reached, it is a hint for you that uh, there is some sort of instability like for example, diffuse necking that has already started in the material if it has got one. Okay. A diffused neck appears in the decreased portion and a non-uniform extension keeps occurring inside the neck until strip collapses. So, what does that mean? So, that means when P max is reached, okay, you may have necking in the material. Okay. So, diffuse necking means what? So, this is a gauge region and the gauge region will have some sort of necking like this okay, over a large region, okay, over a larger gauge length you can imagine. This is the gauge length let us say. Okay, you can imagine that uh, this kind of neck will be formed. Neck means uh, the dimension is going to be area of corrosion is going to be less here as compared to the, the other regions as compared to the other. that indicates that uh, the materials ductility is almost over. So, we have to be careful. Okay. So, after that what is going to happen? You are not going to stop it. You are going to pull the material apart. Then what will happen? Uh, the diffuse necking for example, will be localized in a very small region okay, and then that the both the materials will actually split. So, you will have two different regions like this, you will have two different regions like this. This is your gauge length let us say, this is your gauge length. Initial gauge length what you are referred in the previous graph is this now, okay. so is this now. So, that is the whole process and you call this as a fracture here. So, P y indicates a transit between elastic to plastic deformation, then P max you have to be careful one moment you reach that it indicates that some instability like necking is started and then further deformation will happen, but a reduction of load because there is not much area to uh, support that you know load bearing ability of the material. Okay. So, then what happens is the load will decrease with 
uh, further displacement. Okay. So the load increase here is because of strain hardening and this load decrease is mainly because uh, the deformation is localized in the form of uh, necking. So now this load displacement graph or uh, it is called as load extension graph is just one stage that the material is that the medium machine is going to give you. Okay. So you will see that this load displacement graph may not be sufficient for further analysis for us. So we introduce something called as a engineering stress strain curve. Okay. The engineering stress strain curve is obtained from load extension curve by simply dividing the load by initial cross section area. So this load divided by initial cross section area will give you engineering stress. We will see that formula later. Okay. So although this had the advantage of providing a curve independent of the test piece initial size. Correct. So now same material, different dimensions are there. Okay. So you can have a common engineering stress strain graph just by normalizing it with respect to or dividing it with respect to initial uh, you know, area of cross section. Okay. So that is the advantage it has got. Though this is the case, we are saying that it is still not true material property curve. Okay. So the true material property curve will come in the next stage. Okay. So now what is the actual definition of engineering stress? These are all the standard uh, definition that probably you might have studied. I will just summarize it here. Okay. Engineering stress, sometimes it is called as S, sometimes called as sigma E n g, it is a P by A naught, where P is a load that you got in y axis and A naught is the initial cross section area. And uh, like engineering stress, you also have engineering strain, which is nothing but in x axis. Okay. It is called as small e or sometimes called as E e n g. It is delta L by L naught. What is delta L? Delta L is nothing but uh, the formula which you have used before, isn't it? Delta L is nothing but uh, this fellow. Okay, L minus L naught. Okay, L minus uh, L naught is uh, your delta L. Okay, that uh, delta L by initial gauge length divided by 50 into 100 will give you that in percentage. That means what? 51 minus 50 divided by 50, 52 minus 50 divided by 50, like that you can calculate it and you will get engineering strain in percentage. You can keep it in as it is also. Okay where uh, delta L is a change in length and L naught is the original gauge length. Okay. So now here one thing is very important that what gauge length you are going to pick up. That is why we are saying that your gauge length L naught is a reference length to calculate uh, any strain. Okay. Any strain if you want to calculate this reference length, what length you are going to pick up is going to be very, very important for us. Okay. And uh, yield load we have seen. So from yield load you can get initial yield stress. Okay. It is called as uh, sigma F0 or it is called as sigma Ys also and nothing but Py by A0 where Py is a load at yielding and A0 is the initial cross section area. So if Py is known in the previous diagram you have seen no? uh, Py is known divided by A0 okay, as it is will give you your uh, uh, sigma Y or sigma F0. Okay. So now by using this formula and by using engineering strain formula you can get the engineering stress versus engineering strain graph in this way and uh, you will note that this particular point is nothing but your material yield strength. Okay, and this is your UTS okay, and this is your same fracture. Okay. So how do you get uh, UTS or sigma UTS? It is nothing but P max, the P max which is noted down in the, in the previous graph divided by A0 will give you P max like PY by A0, here P max by A0. Okay. And uh, there are two important uh, properties other than this that is measured here with rest, that is nothing but uh, uniform elongation and uh, total elongation. Okay. This total elongation is nothing but up to fracture, whatever elongation does got up to fracture, which is given actually in the previous graph itself, uh, I have noted down here, it is nothing but L max minus L naught divided by L naught into 100. What is L max? L max is the uh, gauge length once it is fully fractured, say for example, 75, okay. 75 minus 50 divided by 50. Okay. So that is going to give you uh, your E total and uh, for E U, Okay, it is the same formula, only thing is you need to know what is the extension at which this EU has to be referred to. So, for that you need to know what is UTS and the corresponding your uh, you know the length of the sample. Okay. So, that length okay, minus L0 divided by L0 that will give you EU. So, uniform elongation is the elongation at maximum load. Okay. Or what you can do is like since you are already converted everything to engineering strain, already you are converted. So the corresponding strain is nothing but EU. That is what is written here. Okay. So from here to here, what you call is nothing but EU, but up to fracture, full fracture if you refer, that is called E total. That is nothing but total elongation and this is nothing but uniform elongation. So for most of the material, this is important E total minus EU. 
this distance okay e total minus e u uh, that is nothing but this value this is going to be very very crucial okay so now some other uh, known uh, properties you can get uh, for instance uh, you can get uh, yield strength uh, okay that uh, we have already indicated sigma y as yield strength but sigma, uh, e sigma y is generally not obtained by this formula because here py is also not known to us okay practically uh, sigma y is evaluated by a method called as a proof stress evaluation okay but before that you know how to get Young's modulus of the material so it is nothing but uh, your yield strength divided by ey the slope of elastic part of the curve is nothing but elastic modulus also called as uh, Young's modulus so you know how to calculate it okay and uh, in some materials what happens is the transition from elastic to plastic deformation is uh, is going to be unclear okay so there will be a smooth transition there will be a smooth transition from elastic to plastic so in that type of materials you have to be careful and uh, for calculating the yield strength and for that we are going to use this particular method so what we do here is uh, you zoom in uh, to the initial part of the deformation initial part of the curve engineering stress strain curve which is what is given here okay you will see that um, in the engineering strain x axis you pick up 0.2 percent strain assuming that engineering strain is given in percentage okay you pick up a 0.2 percent strain and then you draw a line parallel to the elastic part okay so wherever it's going to hit the curve the corresponding one you can call it as a sigma y okay so in this kind of instances where the transition is going to be smooth you can use proof stress this is the stress required to create a specific tiny plastic strain typically 0 0.2 percentage or roughly twice that of elastic strain at yield okay this elastic strain at yield no elastic strain at yield no so uh, maybe twice then that of that that's what is referred but otherwise generally standard says that 0.2 percent strain you pick up and then you go and hit it in the stress strain curve the corresponding one is nothing but yield strength as shown in the figure proof stress is calculated by drawing a line parallel to elastic loading line offset by specified amount this much amount you are doing okay so this is nothing but your yield stress uh, evaluation okay so now given a load displacement graph we can get engineering stress strain graph and we can get yield strength from there uts from there uniform elongation total elongation all those things can be evaluated okay and of course young modulus can also be evaluated which is nothing but the slope of the elastic part of the deformation so now we are going to convert this engineering stress strain graph into true stress strain curve okay and this true stress strain curve is predominantly used for any engineering analysis Okay, so one issue with the engineering stress strain curve is it is based on initial dimensions of the test piece, right? So now, if you want to uh, really get the real real picture of the deformation, then one has to uh, have some curve which is depending on the instantaneous dimensions, okay? Which is nothing but uh, your true stress strain data or true stress strain curve, okay? Since metals and alloys can deform plastically without significantly changing their volume, the true stress can be calculated from the load extension diagram using the raising portion of the curve that is nothing but your plastic deforming region between the first yielding and the maximum load okay so what we do is we will define true stress and true strain and that can be obtained from uh, the load displacement graph or the engineering stress strain graph okay and uh, mainly in the plastically deforming region okay say this part okay you pick up this part of the region okay and you can get a true stress strain curve which is uh, what is shown in this uh, diagram okay you can see that uh, your y axis is true stress you need to same mega pascal okay so true strain uh, you can keep it in percentage also and you will see that the graph starts here and it keeps on increasing okay so you will see that there is always an increasing trend okay uh, that's the main difference between elastic uh, your engineering stress strain graph and true stress strain graph okay and uh, this part is your uh, sigma f naught which is nothing but yield strength and uh, this is nothing but a uniform elongation we have drawn up to that only okay of course two stress data can be obtained beyond that also okay but uh, this is this curve is drawn only up to your uniform uh, elongation that is up to uts so yield strength to your uts part you are converting into two stress strain data okay so now what we are going to do is we are going to define what is true stress that is nothing but sigma so engineering stress we referred as yes engineering strain is referred as uh, i think uh, uh, e okay and uh, here true stress we are actually referring it as a sigma so sigma is nothing but p by a 
So, A naught is the initial area of cross section, but A is nothing but instantaneous cross sectional area or area of cross section. Okay. So, uh, P is actually given by the load displacement graph, okay. but how do you get A? Because A is going to be changing with the deformation. So, for that what you are going to do is you are going to pick up this particular important you know equation volume of the gauge region is considered constant in plastic deformation. Okay. So, we know that it is A naught L naught will be equal to A L. So, A naught L naught will give you initial uh, picture of the sample or initial size and A L is going to be instantaneous one. Okay. So, A naught is known to you, okay. L naught is 50 mm, okay. A naught is known to you, A naught is nothing but let us say uh, area of cross section is nothing but uh, your uh, you know width into thickness. So, width of the sample is known to you W naught which is known to you and thickness is known let us say 1 mm. Okay. So, we can get uh, initial volume and uh, A is the one which you are going to evaluate and L is nothing but uh, your instantaneous length which is also known to you, okay, which is also known to you okay, because you are the one who is going to deform. Let us say 50 mm gauge length will become 51, 52, 53. So, you know the length. So, from this uh, A can be obtained uh, and I am going to substitute here. So, A is nothing but A naught L naught divided by L which I will keep it here which is nothing but uh, P by A naught into L by L naught. A naught L naught by L. So, L goes to numerator. So, P L by A naught L naught is going to be your sigma. So, I can get true stress now because P is known, A naught is known, L naught is known, L can be calculated at every uh, each and every level of deformation. So, I will get it. So, now when it comes to true strain, it is generally represented as epsilon, or generally represented as epsilon. So, epsilon is nothing but integral d epsilon you can say for small deformation d epsilon can be written as d L by L. Okay. So, if you integrate it from L naught to L, okay, where L naught is your initial gauge length or reference length and L uh, is the length of the you know uh, instantaneous length of the gauge length okay, or the final length at which fracture happens whichever is the reference for you wherever you want to calculate you can calculate it. So, L it will give you L of L by L naught where L is your instantaneous length gauge length and L naught is your initial gauge length. Okay. So, this is also known to you because L is known to you here itself. So, the same L will come and L naught is let us say 50 mm. Okay. So, now you have sigma and epsilon. So, you have load then you have uh, delta L curve okay. from there onwards you can directly get sigma versus epsilon. Okay that is one way. The other is another way also P L say you can get S E okay. that means engineering stress, engineering strain from there also you can get sigma epsilon which is what is given here. So, you need to relate uh, engineering stress and true stress, engineering strain and true strain which is what is given in this particular discussion. So, we know the sigma is equal to P by A which is nothing but P by A naught, A naught by A naught I am keeping. So, A naught, A naught will be cancelled, P by A will remain. So, it is correct. So, what is uh, P by A naught? Nothing but my engineering stress, yes. A naught by A, uh, A naught by A would be equal to L by L naught I am keeping. So, L by L naught will remain same. Fine. So, now engineering strain, I will come back to this formula. So, engineering strain is nothing but L minus L naught divided by L naught that also we have seen already delta L by L naught we said, uh, we said delta L this is nothing but delta L no, delta L by L naught we said. So, nothing but L minus L naught by L naught which is nothing but L by L naught minus 1. So, L by L naught is nothing but uh, L by L naught is nothing but 1 plus uh, E. Okay. So, I am going to put 1 plus E here okay, and I will get uh, sigma is equal to S into 1 plus E. Okay. Sigma is equal to S into 1 plus uh, E. So, here you will see that uh, if I do not want to evaluate sigma versus epsilon graph directly from load displacement graph, then I can use this route also. So, first you calculate engineering stress and engineering strain with the usual procedure described before and using this formula sigma is equal to S into 1 plus C, I can get uh, sigma. Similarly, what I can get is epsilon also. So, epsilon is nothing but ln of L by L naught. So, L by L naught is nothing but 1 plus C. So, epsilon is equal to L naught ln of uh, natural logarithm of 1 plus C. Okay. So, this will give me my sigma versus uh, epsilon graph which looks like uh, uh, the one I have written before. Okay. This is nothing but sigma you can say nothing but epsilon. Okay. It will look like this. Okay. But one has to be very, very careful in using these equations uh, because uh, we do not know 
uh, how accurately you are going to measure once uh, the necking starts okay after p max or after uts you have to be careful in evaluating the dimensions because necking is going to happen one may not measure the dimensions accurately so you have to use uh, this equations this calculations uh, suitably okay so but uh, this is an important thing so here i will again tell the nomenclature here sigma is nothing but true stress s is nothing but engineering stress e is nothing but uh, your engineering strain epsilon is true strain e is engineering strain so we are going to use this sigma s e okay and epsilon sigma epsilon s e in this fashion only okay so now then comes uh, how do you relate a stress and strain okay so in the elastic part of deformation we know a hooke's law sigma is equal to e into epsilon which is going to be used for permanently to describe the uh, stress strain relationship where e is nothing but your young modulus through which you calculate young modulus before okay but beyond that okay this uh, equation has to be modified and there are several equations of that type uh, we will see a little later on what is it one important uh, is basically power law okay this is an important uh, equation sigma is equal to k epsilon power n this is like a power law y is equal to ax power b type okay so where sigma is nothing but your true stress again epsilon is going to be true strain okay we have to be careful in this okay again again i am saying sigma means true stress epsilon means here true strain only okay so now this kn n actually is going to vary depending on the material okay so different material may have different load displacement graph and hence a different stress strain graph so unless otherwise you do something to the material it's not going to change so stress strain graph is going to be a material property okay you do something to the material then it will change otherwise no it's not going to change so which means that this k and n are nothing but material property of this particular uh, available in this equation okay and this one way to evaluate this basically to take a logarithm on both sides and you will get ln of sigma is equal to ln of k plus n is power so it comes front n ln of log of epsilon okay so and this you can easily understand is of the form y is equal to m max plus c where c is this fellow and your m is nothing but your n hmm so and this k and n has got a specific name and we are going to use this predominantly this particular equation predominantly throughout the course so one should remember this where n is called as strain hardening index okay sometimes called as strain hardening exponent and k is called as strength coefficient k is called as strength coefficient okay and again sigma is in true stress epsilon is true strain so k is strength coefficient n is strain hardening index or strain hardening exponent you can say so how to get this now so now you are converted into a straight line plot okay where this is your y and this fellow is your x so i am going to draw x versus y where y is your log sigma and log epsilon you can take and you pick up the stress strain data only in the plastic deforming zone that is between yield strength and uts okay and you convert all that sigma epsilon into logarithmic plot like this okay and uh, you will see that generally you get a straight line fit like this but not all materials will slow uh, will will show one straight line okay but generally most of the materials show this one straight line like this and slope of this curve is given by n okay if you take slope of this then it will become n so you will get one particular value here okay and the intercept of that will give you k and the intercept of that will give you okay so in this way one can get k and n okay so what do you do is basically you convert a power law into a straight line fit and the slope of that curve will be given by uh, n okay or in other words slope of that curve gives n okay which is nothing but the strain hardening exponent and the intercept in a way will give you k and here i have clearly written that it is only in the plastically deforming zone okay so this way one can get k and n and you will see that uh, once you have a stress strain behavior okay true stress strain behavior done so you have load displacement graph from that you have s versus e engineering stress strain graph from there you get uh, sigma versus epsilon true stress strain graph and true and stress and true strain are related by uh, this particular simple power law sigma is equal to k epsilon power n which actually describes the the strain hardening part of the curve okay this power law is nothing but uh, the one which describes the strain hardening part of the curve okay and uh, this you are converting into this particular plot 
okay, and uh, you are going to get k and n in this fashion which I told. Okay. So, now the accuracy of calculating k and n depends on how good the fit between the sigma versus epsilon graph that you get from this equation and the original true stress strain curve. Okay. So, let us say you have true stress strain data that you obtained from experiments in this route. Okay. In this route you got it. Okay. Now, what you have done is nothing but you are fitting the true stress strain graph into this equation. Okay. Let us say for example, you are calculating this equation as let us say sigma is equal to let us say 200 epsilon power 0 0.25. Okay, we will see several such equations in the problems. Okay, you will get some flavor. Okay, sigma is equal to 200 epsilon power 0 0.25, where epsilon is going to be changing accordingly. Sigma is going to change. Okay, so if you have accurately calculated this 200 and 0 0.25 or k and n, then your true stress strain data from the experiment and this equation is going to match. So it's all about fitting the stress strain data that you get from experiments using this type of equation. Okay. So, now you will see that uh, from a tensile test you are going to calculate uh, this type of uh, uh, you know evaluate this type of equations, uh, but actually tensile test you will see that uh, the material is going to fail at one particular strain, but in actual sheet forming operations uh, may undergo large deformation where strains can be much larger than the strain that you see in tensile test. Okay. So, in that region of deformation okay, where you do not have data what you can do is you can use this equation extrapolate. Okay. You can extrapolate this equation and you can use it and relate sigma versus epsilon okay, and relate sigma and epsilon beyond tensile test also. Okay. Otherwise, you do not know how to extend it beyond your two stress strain data that you get from experiments. If you want to extrapolate it, you need some form of equation right? and this fit equation will give you that okay, predominantly uh, in the uh, extrapolator region. Okay. So, now this completes the tensile test part, you know how to get uh, you, know, uh, you know different properties uh, uh, you know uh, k and n everything you know how to get it. Okay. We will work out some problems, things will be clear. So, other than that there is one more important property of the material called as uh, uh, anisotropy. Okay. So, uh, this anisotropy you will see that uh, is a very important property predominantly for sheet materials. Okay. So, uh, Isotropic materials have identical qualities evaluated in all directions. Okay. Suppose you take a sheet, okay. you take a sheet okay, and you know that the sheets are actually rolled sheets. Right? So, it undergoes a prior deformation when it comes to actual applications. Right? Because of this rolling, okay, the properties can change with respect to rolling directions and that is quantified by uh, you know uh, something we define as anisotropy of the material. Okay. Anisotropy of the material means okay, the properties Okay, will differ when tested in specific directions such as let us say rolling direction transverse to that and at 45 degree direction to rolling direction. Okay, this deviation is generally referred to as a planar anisotropy. So, we are going to define it with a simple formula in the next slide which will make us to understand it very easily. Okay. So, when you go to industrial sheets level which are actually rolled sheets then quantifying this anisotropy is going to be very very important which are nothing but you take a tensile test sample and do tensile test like the way we described in rolling direction along the rolling direction or transverse to the rolling direction 45 degree to the rolling direction their properties are going to be different. Okay. So, now there is one more point the average of the properties in the plane of the sheet and those in the through thickness direction may also differ from one another. That means uh, on the plane suppose this has got a sheet okay, the sheet plane okay, and in the through thickness direction okay, what are the properties in the through thickness direction they are also not going to be same, they differ. Okay. So, now how to quantify this anisotropy in sheets okay. and then we define something called as a plastic strain ratio called as R okay, which is typically used to represent condition of anisotropy in materials whose characteristics vary with the direction. So, here we are specifically speaking about a rolling direction. Okay. Let us say this is your rolling direction, we are calling it as RD perpendicular to that is TD okay, and in the through thickness direction is in this way. Okay, and 45 degree direction means in the plane itself this is 45. One can go for other discretization also 0, 30, 60, 90 that way also one can go. The simplest way to divide that is 0, 45 and TD or 90 degree. Okay, so, how do you define this R? It is generally referred as capital R or sometimes referred as small r also. So, R is defined as or plastic standards are defined as the ratio of width strain to 
thickness tree. Okay, R is nothing but epsilon W by epsilon T. As we said in the previous slide, epsilon means true strain, so which means its width strain, that is true quantity divided by thickness strain. Okay. So to further to calculate, this is true strain, so it's nothing but ln of W by W naught, where W is instantaneous width, and the thickness instantaneous thickness ln of T by T naught. Okay, which is nothing but ln of W by W naught and T by T naught can be written as W naught L naught divided by W L. Okay, so we are saying that W naught L naught T naught would be equal to W L T. So you need a T by T naught, right? So T by T naught will give you T would be W L and here you have W naught L naught. Okay, so of course uh, if you do not want this. Uh, requirement you can still stay with this this stage of equation. So true width strain divided by true thickness strain. It means suppose if these two strains are equal when you go for deformation. Suppose you take a strip of sheet and then you deform it. Okay, you will see that these two strains are equal. That means R is equal to one. What does that mean? That means uh, in width direction and thickness direction you have almost uh, same strain, which means the material is supposed to be isotropic in nature. Any deviation from this or not equal to one will tell that material is uh, anisotropic, material is uh, anisotropic in nature. So R can be less than 1 or greater than 1 depending on the material. Okay. So now how do you calculate this R? There are standard procedures for this, uh, I have described it here. Okay. So uh, of course the ASTM standard, this number is also provided here for the sample. So what we do is a very simple test like tensile test only. So here what you do is you take a rectangular sample a typical dimension, you can say this is 175 mm, ah, this is total length, this is 28.58 mm. So you can refer to this ASTM standard and uh, at the geometric center of the sample, you will put uh, this indents, this is 20 mm and this is a uh, 20 mm indents you put. Okay. And then what do you do? It is the same UTM on which you would done tensile test, you hold it on one side and you pull it on the other side, give some displacement, you have to stop the test. So when is it? In the tensile test actually you stopped it until fracture, it has to fully fracture but here you stop it at 15 percentage strain, okay, uh, at 15 percentage of this 20 mm, 15 percentage of this uh, 20 mm. So what do you do here is uh, R value measurement are taken at uh, strain equal to 15 percentage. Okay. So what do you do? You can calculate 15 percentage of 20 mm okay, and add it to 20 mm, okay. this, this 20 mm length uh, because length is a measure which you can control. Okay. Let us say for example that has become let us say 23 mm or 24 mm like that. Okay. So then what do you do? You stop the test at that particular instant. So you know the new length, right? you know the new width, right? length will increase, width has to decrease and accordingly thickness will also reduce in this particular location. So with the change in this length, with change in width and change in thickness, you can calculate all the three strains, isn't it? You can get epsilon L you can get epsilon w and you can get epsilon t and what is the formula for r? r is given by true width strain divided by true thickness strain. So you need only this strain and this strain which you can get it by measuring it. With the microscope you can measure the new width that will give you epsilon w uh, with a micrometer okay, or a screw gauge, sharpened screw, screw gauge, pointed screw gauge, you can get the thickness at maybe 5 different locations and you can get new thickness, take an average that will give you epsilon t. Okay, so from this uh, you can get uh, r value. Okay, so then you will feel that uh, okay, r is let us say 1.3, the material is anisotropic, r is let us say 0.85, material is anisotropic in nature. Okay. So now this r value can be calculated in 0 degree rolling direction, we call it as r naught, along 90 degree rolling direction that is r 90 and along 45 degree rolling direction that is r 45. Okay. So in that way it can vary with the several uh, such angles are there, isn't it? So one has to have some averaged quantity which is actually given by R bar. Okay. So this R bar is nothing but average plastic strain ratio, it is also representing something called as normal plastic anisotropy ratio which is generally given by R0 plus R45 plus, uh, plus R90 plus 2 R45 divided by 4. So you calculate R0 you have to test it separately, two width strain divided by true thickness strain, you do separate test again in this direction, so you will get two different thing, in 45 degree direction again you get uh, from, v, from dt, so now you have three values, right, substitute it in this formula, you will get a r bar. Okay. 
So one has to be a little bit careful when you divide this equally. So it is not mandatory that you have to divide it uh, only at 45 degree intervals. You can also divide it in other intervals also. Let us say 0, then you have 30, okay, then you have uh, you know 60, then uh, you have a 90. Okay. So otherwise you can have a 0, 15, 30, 45, okay, then uh, other angles up to 90 you can calculate. So accordingly you have to change the formula. Formula is not going to remain same, one has to be careful. Okay. And uh, in the plane of the sheet, how R value is changing, that can be referred with respect to planar anisotropy, okay, which is given by delta R. Delta R is nothing but R0 plus R90 divided by 2 minus R45. Otherwise, you can also write R0 plus R90 minus 2 R45 divided by 2, okay, where R0, R45, R90 are plastic stain division, rolling, diagonal and transverse directions. Okay. This delta R can be positive or negative in nature. This is an average value. So, generally it is a, an average quantity of R0, R45 and R, R90. Again, one has to be very, very careful in using this formula for different sets of rolling directions which I have referred here. This is valid only for 0, 45, 90 degree rolling direction. Okay. So, one has to look into it. So, now uh, given a sheet, you can get uh, R value and then you can get uh, R bar and then you can get uh, delta R. Okay. So, what is the use of this R bar, delta R, all those things we will see in the next uh, uh, lecture. And uh, just to summarize what we have seen today, I introduced the sheet forming process. Okay. So, variety of sheet forming process we have briefly discussed. Some of them you will see elaborately in the, uh, in the uh, next future classes. Okay. And after that, predominantly we discussed about the tension test, okay, which is very mandatory for any characterizing any sheets. And, uh, that is also used to model the, uh, you know, uh, sheet uh, deformation. Okay, so we started with uh, how to get load displacement graph in UTM, and then converting that to engineering stress strain graph, and then to true stress strain graph. So true stress strain graph, we said sigma epsilon graph is the main, uh, you know, uh, data that we need. So how to fit the true stress strain data in the form of an equation? Let us say power law sigma is equal to k epsilon power n, where n is the strain hardening exponent and k is the strength coefficient. If a fit is accurate, then experimental data and the data from the equation is going to be uh, agreeing well. Okay. Then uh, uh, I discussed with you briefly about uh, anisotropy, how to calculate the sheet anisotropy which is generally created by rolling operation. Okay. Then you refer something called as R0, R45, R90 with respect to rolling direction where R0 is along the rolling direction. And then uh, we defined uh, a parameter called plastic strain ratio or a property plastic strain ratio which is defined as 2 width strain divided by 2 thickness strain and how to calculate R for material is also described with simple testing procedure which is shown in this uh, uh, figure. Okay. So, from there onwards we introduce something called R bar which is like an average quantity and then delta R which is going to tell you how different is R value in the plane. Okay. So, R0 plus R90 by 2 minus R45. So, you take an average of R0 and R90 and you compare that with R45, how different they are, that will be given by delta R, that is called planar anisotropy of the sheets. Okay? So, with this we will stop and then you will see in the next class.